So good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining this uh, fourth Berlin Real Estate Talk. Today, our guest is Mr. Volker Mauch, um, solicitor and attorney in Berlin, Germany. Hello, Volker. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining this call. So Volker is a lawyer in, um, in Berlin and his uh, field is uh, buying uh, properties within Germany for international clients. There are a few questions we have on the day-to-day -day business. We, of course, as a, as a broker, refer your, uh, um, you as a, as a solicitor, as a local solicitor. So first of all, you, you have been talking about income taxes, if you just address the tax situation. Does this change if you're based, let's say, in another country, not in Germany? Is there something people need to know? No, in general, the taxation is the same. There are, um, if you are, the Germany makes a distinction between um, fully tax resident or limited tax, tax resident. So limited tax, if someone is fully taxable or limited taxable. If you are living in Germany, then you are fully taxable with your world income in Germany. And then there's a, so you, you basically have to declare all your income wherever you get it in Germany and then double taxation treaties may free you from the taxation if it's about limited taxable people. So the typical foreign investor who doesn't live in Germany, they are only taxable with their German income. Yeah, and German income is, for example, real estate income from real estate that's located in Germany. They will not get the free amounts, the tax free amounts that someone has who lives in Germany because that is supposed to be for living expenses unless he applies for being fully taxed in Germany, which is usually not an option. But that's the only difference that I can think of um, between residents between residents and non-residents. There's clearly no distinction between Germans and non-Germans. Okay, thank you. Um, continuing on the, on the tax topic, um, a lot of people don't really do any tax returns, especially when they have bought a property and they haven't used the law firm, they don't even have an accountant in Germany. And then they usually contact us after 10 years, 12 years and say, Hey guys, can you please sell my apartment? Um, what do you recommend in this um, scenario? Well, I mean, you sh I recommend to, to get in contact with an accountant yeah, to make really the calculation for whether you had to pay taxes or not. Um, if you declare the taxes, the um, afterwards, even if you did not, if you do it before the financial authorities write to you, then actually it's, there's no, no fine or anything. But actually the chances you probably have received, they probably have received mail from the tax authorities because when you purchase the apartment, you have to pay the purchase tax. And for that, the tax authorities will know that you have bought an apartment and that's also when they usually write you letters and say please make a tax declaration at the end of the year so it's quite unlikely that there's nothing at all no file at all about you in this case okay thank you then there is a, um, a big difference between the uh, purchase tax or the stamp duty uh, and the difference between the land tax <laughs> or property tax on a yearly basis a lot of people are contacting us and they want to understand the difference between the, 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 the two different taxes. Maybe you can quickly explain what is the difference. The land tax. Well, the land tax is that local tax that I meant before. The, it's that fairly small amount and uh, transferable to the tenant. Um, so this is more, you can see it more like a service charge for the city. So that's one of the ways the city finances itself um, and that they build roads with it to your apartment. They, they make sure that the police is outside. So it's, it's basically a fee for the communal services. Um, and the other tax that you wanted to distinguish from that was the purchase tax. Yeah. The purchase tax is, well, it's also a local tax. So in a way the, the purpose is the same, but it's a one-time tax. So it's just once you paid once when you purchased the apartment, you never have to deal with it again until it's sold. And then it's the buyer who usually pays for it. Yeah. Coming back to the legal side. So um, we have, of course, the transaction costs. A lot of our customers who are not used with the German property market or with the transaction as such 
um, always asking us on the high transaction costs. So what, what's so this these are the, the, the one off costs we are we are looking at. But of course, we, we, we have a lot of questions. And why do I need a law firm, an international law firm in Germany to buy my property? Why, what is this? What is the advantage? Why don't I fly to Germany? I only use a broker. Uh, I can do it all myself. What, what do you what do you think? Well, in theory, you can do most of the things yourself, but of course, you will not be able to understand the, the documentation. That is, unless you're fluent in German, um, you will probably also not fully understand the, the contracts. Um, so, especially when it comes to to the um, documentation about existing apartments, but also about building projects, it's quite important that you really are able to read to understand the history of it because used apartments in Germany are usually sold without any warranty. So it's quite important to have a proper, inf a proper picture of what state the apartment is actually in, also legally. And um, new apartments, of course, the, the whole contract setup is quite a bit more difficult. So you, I, from my point of view, it's always, I always think, okay, you make a very large investment, probably one of the largest investments in your life, um, and you're doing that completely unsecured. Um, I have a few examples of clients who came to me afterwards where I thought this would have been very, very good to have, a, to have an attorney before because there are many contracts that look actually quite all right to someone who doesn't know the German system, but they are for, an, for a legal person very clear that this is not a contract that secures you against the builder stopping to build, the builder going bankrupt, um, defects that have been, that, that could have been seen and you, you, you just didn't know which documents to ask for. So there are, I think it's for a large investment like that, it's actually worth to be somewhat secure. The other point maybe is um, if you want a mortgage, uh, it will probably be quite difficult for you to get a mortgage in Germany without um, an account in Germany. And you will, I mean, of course, if you travel to Germany, you may be able to open an account. There are some banks which sometimes do it to, to open accounts quickly, but we work with a trust account. So we open trust accounts for our clients for each purchase. And that actually allows you to get a financing in Germany as well without having to um, have your own bank account and without coming to Germany, basically. Yeah, I think this is very important. And I mean, for all these listeners, I think Volker has um, overseen more than 1,000 transactions in his career, especially in, 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 in selling off-plan properties through various agents. I think you work for, I think, most of the leading agents here in Germany. Uh, uh, quite a lot and um, so uh, from my from my perspective just for these listeners um, out there if you are flying in Germany and not using an international law firm you do have to speak German fluently and the notary this is the biggest question so a lot of our customers ask me hey the notary is the independent solicitor to make sure the transaction goes smooth which is true but the notary his job is not to represent your interest as a buyer his job is to make sure that the transaction is going through properly together with the land registry that all these documents are fine. So this is a very important for international people to be aware of that when you fly into Germany, you don't only have to speak German fluently, the notary will ask you, do you understand German fluently? And if he doesn't have the feeling that you do not understand German fluently, he will not continue the exchange of contracts. So then we have to get a sworn in translator, which we also are using, but they have no clue on what they're translating. Sorry, I don't want to be uh, any bad to the spawn and translations and, and they will not give any guarantee of what's happening. So, and the fees for these translations, the spawn and translations are anything between 1,000 to 2,000 euros per transaction only and you have no further guarantee. So this is something, uh, just for all these listeners, maybe you want to add something on this, um, Volker, from your perspective? No, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, if you really add up the costs of flying to Germany, having a translator here, um, you're probably not saving that much money um, with that. And uh, you have, uh, again, with, we, we offer a complete service package because we see that um, a foreign investor just really needs a full, full package. We also offer the services, not just in English, but in, in uh, many languages, Chinese, Russian, Italian, French, uh, so it's, you, will prob you will find someone who can really communicate and explain you the contract in a proper way in our office. Um, 
I can just say that most of the clients actually usually are very surprised afterwards how much they have received for the money. Um, and if you add up the cost that you would have you do it yourself, you probably don't save that much. Yeah. So I think it's a quite good. There's, thank you, Volker. There's one big thing. You just said that in a side sentence regarding bank accounts and opening bank accounts in Germany. So I'm just today. It's um, what day is it? The 23rd. 23rd. Thank you. The 23rd of, of June. And today we just had another three clients who could not raise a mortgage in Germany because they do not have a German bank account. And it's very, very difficult to open a bank account in Germany if you don't rent or own an apartment. And if you, and if you don't have a bank account, it might be difficult to rent an apartment like in other countries worldwide. <clears throat> well, it's in general getting more difficult. And it's um, that to get the, it seems to me that it's getting more and more difficult to get um, accounts. We were a couple of years ago, it was quite easy to walk into most banks um, and get an account. But by now, the international banks all are very hesitating. They want a lot of documentation before they open an account because they're all a bit worried that they might um, break some um, money laundering rules and get fined for that. So, so they're they're very, very careful in opening accounts. So we had that a few times that people had to come a couple of times to be able to open the account um, if they really wanted one. And um, it's uh, it's just now it's only really some small local banks, which to my what well, some local banks still sometimes do it, but then again you have no English website, you have no English online banking, not ideal as well. I mean, and it's of course also it's costing you some money in that. So um, from, from yeah. by to interrupt you because we're running a bit short of time. We have a lot of other questions. Just a big one for all these people buying off plan from developers. Uh, you have touched this uh, topic very, um, very briefly in your presentation. When, for all these listeners out there, when you buy in Germany from a developer, you are fairly safe. However, these developer contracts are done with certain rules and regulations in Germany, very, very strict. Um, they are called MABV, MABV or MABV regulations. Uh, maybe you can say something to this, Volker, because it's quite unique in Germany, how it works here. Yeah, there is, okay, there, there is a special law for for protection of um, buyers from off-plan buildings, mostly with the idea that they don't want the, the, the buyer shall be protected, the consumer shall be protected from putting all his money into a building and then the developer going bankrupt and the, the, the consumer basically having nothing. So that's the concept behind it. So for that reason, you have certain securities in the land register um, that have to be provided like a priority notice that's basically it um, and you have to have some um, you have to have some securities against the mortgages that are usually still on the project and you have to um, the developer has to provide certain building progresses before the he can ask for any money so this is the positive side of the um, the building the the off-plan um, projects that being said, offline board projects have their own problems. Yeah, so the I would say ninety percent of the or ninety five percent of the developers who who do off plan are absolutely following these rules, and that's why it is then quite safe. But um, first of all, you have five percent who don't. Yeah, who really try to do it differently, and they also find notaries who do it. Um, and then you have usually, you have to see that the notary in this case is really working for this developer almost only because he's always the same notary. And then you have a problem as well because you have a certain dependency. Um, that's one problem. And the other, I mean, the other problem is that you have all these securities, for example, to make sure that the apartment will not have any debts from the developer by the time you get it, which are all quite complicated. So the problems in my, in my experience is that the contracts are 98% or 99% good, fine in the development, but the implementation, that's where the problems happen and where the mistakes happen. And the result of such a mistake, just making not, fully, not fulfilling one of the conditions of the mortgaging bank of the developer is that basically the clients are under, unprotected again. So there is, the, say, as I say, the building off-plan buildings are have some extra securities, but they also have some extra 
um, risks. So um, I think that is actually not enough protection what is offered there to the consumer. Great. Thank you, Volker. I would now come to the questions people have sent us in in the last two weeks. So um, I think the first question we have here is from, uh, from Victor. Can I sign the contract from abroad and how does it work practically? Yeah, so that's I think what I tried to explain before. You, you cannot sign it from abroad, but you can, of course, get it signed by us and then give us a power of attorney to represent you there. Or if that's complicated, you could also sometimes authorize it afterwards. The most of the vendors will, will want you to have a power of attorney so that there is a binding contract and they don't have to wait another couple of weeks for it to be authorized. So the power of attorney is usually the way to go for the signing from abroad. And we this is part of our standard services, so that's included, fully included in our standard fee. Great. Um, then there's another question from Tina. What has changed since the, since the corona crisis with regards to financing property in Germany for EU residents and third country residents? Mm. Not much uh, with respect to real estate. Um, generally, the whole the whole real estate market has not been affected very much of the Corona crisis. I mean, much less than any other um, 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 field of business. The um, of course, traveling to Germany is even more difficult now. And um, I know that in some countries, the possibilities to make the power of attorneys have been a bit restricted. But to my from my experience, they're all opening up very very quick now, especially this week, there have been another one, another few have been opening in the Middle East. So I think it's very much back to normal. Um, what might be different is that um, because of the Brexit, the conditions actually have gone better for um, British investors, but that's, that's everything. There's no, there's no halt or anything apart from difficulties to travel to Germany. But as I said before, most of our clients don't do that anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have another question from China. Lily has asked a question. Um, I declared the rental income for 2019 to Berlin Finanzamt, although I'm no longer a resident in Germany. I want to know if I'm doing things correctly. Also, I would like to know the tax law issues when I sell my property if I'm not a resident of Germany. Okay, well, the um, yes, declaring the income from your the rental income when you're not a resident in Germany, that is absolutely correct. Um, you should use a different form. Um, it makes your life much easier to use the form for the people who have a limited tax liability than the unlimited one. So honestly, I always recommend to um, speak to an accountant who can fill out that form with you. That's uh, much more efficient than actually asking asking us to fill out a form for you. Uh, and that um, will probably you probably save the money of the accountant when there's such a change. I mean, if you have the same situation over ten years, it's always the same income. Uh, you're in the same, live in the same country. There's no change. You can maybe make it yourself after a while. But if you have a change, I always recommend to get a con, um, an accountant to do this tax declaration with you. But it looks right. Looks quite right what you're doing now. And about the taxes when you sell the property when you're not a resident of Germany, I mean, I explained that a bit before. It doesn't really depend on the, whether you are a resident of Germany or not. The exemption for the, for the taxes after 10 years apply also to non-residents. Um, you probably, if you don't live in Germany anymore, you probably have rented out your apartment now. So you're probably not ap um, um, eligible for the, for the, um, own usage tax exemption, so they're using it for three, two and a half, three years, but the tax freedom after 10 years is still an option for you. Thank you. Um, then there is another question from Edlin. Um, I think she's from Denmark. She's just asking how does the money laundry law in Germany applies and how as a vendor of property or as a buyer, what you need to know, what is important? Um, Okay, it's a complicated subject because the um, money laundering rules are uh, are complicated by themselves. So we have a couple of levels where we have to deal with money laundering regulations. Um, the in general, there's no there's no there's not a general proof of 
clean money when you invest in Germany. So you have, um, you have to make some declarations yourself, yeah, that you're working, that you're not working on behalf of someone else. Um, these are questions that we ask you, that we have to ask you, um, for example, and that you are not a politically exposed person and stuff like that. And um, there's also the notary has to make sure that some has probably asked you the same question or they usually ask the same questions. And then there is on the level of the banks, they do their own um, anti-money laundering uh, checks. And they are usually the most, um, they usually do it with the most scrutiny because they have the toughest rules. So it's very likely that you will have to, when you transfer the money to Germany, whichever way you do it, whether you do it into our trust account or whether you do it directly to the developer, whether you do it to your own bank account in Germany, then the bank will probably come back to you at some point and say, please give us information where this money is coming from. And then you will have to show, okay, this is um, 50, I got, a, I got a bonus last year of 50,000 euros or I had, um, I've sold an apartment in Beijing for 200,000 euros. So you have to, will have to show where that money is coming from and um, that has to persuade the respective um, money laundering department in that bank. Yeah, but there's no, there's no, I cannot say, okay, you have to give this and that document and this will be sufficient. It's really an ongoing process that will be always dealing with, mostly with the bank. Um, okay, thank you. I have another question here from uh, Felix. Um, uh, I think it's, it's a bit of uh, rephrasing, but I think uh, the question is, how can kids who have purchased a property um, transfer the rental income into another country? I mean, are there anything, any, any important things we need to know or is it just a bank, normal bank transfer? No, normal, normal bank transfer. They can transfer it uh, normally. I mean, we have to again look at the gift tax if, they, if they're gifting money if they are gifting the money it doesn't have to mean i mean quite often from my experience it's not really gifting but the parents gave them the money for the apartment first so it's more like repaying a mortgage but of course you have to make sure that this is properly done so you don't have the tax um, officials at your heels once you pay the, the children basically pay that back okay then of course we have um, here's another question from robert he wants to know how to raise a mortgage as a foreigner within Germany. I know you are the, the lawyer, not the mortgage broker, but um, it's just another question here. Do you want to answer to this question? Um, well, I mean, of course, I, I'm, I've seen many of my clients getting these mortgages and we, we do the, we, we of course implement it. That means the bank usually on the legal side, the bank will make a contract with you. Yeah. And we will, they will want securities for the for the mortgage, for the loan one of them is a land charge i try to avoid the term mortgage sometimes because it means kind of both the land charge and the loan so the loan is the contract that they owe the money to the bank the land charge is what's inscribed in the land register and that is the security for the bank so again that is something that needs to be done at the notary and we will do it with the power of attorney that the clients give us and they also usually want some personal liability of the client for the for the mortgage that's that's all something that we take care of but the actual procedure of applying and getting it i think you're probably more qualified to to, to talk about that because you're, you're closer to that yeah thank you yes i think it's we usually work with international mortgage brokers who, who do this for the clients and there is a big difference between applying for a mortgage as a german resident or taxpayer where you have a german track record on credit scores, like in other countries worldwide. And of course, usually the bank gives you a better interest and a higher LTV, so loan to value, if you want to buy a property as a German citizen or someone who lives in Germany, who has a track record, uh, you, get, you get far better deals. However, you need to prove to the bank that you have the last three year steady income, if you're independent or, or you have a, a full permanent residency. There are quite a lot of other things they want to see. Um, but for international people who do not have uh, any track record in Germany for income or who don't want to give other securities, we call that a so-called non-recourse mortgage uh, or loan, which means that only the property stands against the, uh, for, for, as a security for the bank against the loan they're giving you. 
So this might be the biggest advantage. That's why Falker in his presentation had only 54% LTV loan to value, which is of course a conservative approach. If you're lucky and you have a good mortgage broker and if the property, because a bank of course will value the property in of course in which city in Germany, so you can go up up to 70%. Of course, prices in Germany have risen in the last uh, five, seven, eight, ten 10 years quite significant. So banks are always very conservative when they do finances, but it's always a good thing to speak to your mortgage broker or to your estate agent or real realtor if you want to give you um, LTV quotes from banks because this is another indication on the value of the property. But this of course would be a different topic in a different, uh, in a different field. Um, we just have another, uh, I think eight minutes. So I wanna run through a few nice um, uh, other, other questions. For you as a, as a solicitor Falker, um, you, you people are, Want to, and they have maybe not listened to the full hour of, of, for the full presentation. So what, what do you think here? Muhammad is asking these questions. Um, I would like a general overview of the most important issues you would recommend to international buyers within Germany. Maybe the top three points, top four points, what you need to know when you want to buy. Because of course, if you, if you Google the internet, you know, if you search the internet, the typical property portals, or maybe you have spoken to a realtor or a broker in your country who are offering German properties, what do you think is very important for someone who has really no idea about Germany uh, in terms of the legal situation? What do they need to know? Well, I think in general, it is, um, it is good to know to, um, to, to have a look at what you're, who you're dealing with here. I mean, that's common sense basically to what kind of, um, what's, what's the setup, what's realistic. I've had clients who, who basically bought properties from, um, with building times of, uh, I don't know, seven to nine months um, from start to completion. And it was obvious, I mean, like they came later to me and it was obvious that this could have never worked. And that, of course, is always an alarm sign. If you have some someone who promises you something that just seems really unrealistic, it's also important, I think, in Germany to have um, um, to work with a with a broker you can trust because the there are there's quite some confusion about what is good areas and what is not good areas in the bigger cities, especially in I mean, just talking about Berlin, there are, there are areas which are actually more far out and still considered very good than some really central ones. So I think you should really have someone who can reliably give you some information there. Um, um, and the, the terms of what is what, like parts of town that often sound very similar to, to people. It doesn't mean that that really what sounds similar is close to each other. Um, from, the, from the legal point of view, um, yeah, don't don't try to save the last penny. Yeah, um, no, usually agreements that you make with the developer have to be fully notarized. Yeah, and I've had a couple of cases where developers were not so good with the developers, I must say, but trying to to talk the client into just doing something at the side. Yeah, doing something without notarizing it. That is very risky. Yeah, you risk that the whole contract becomes invalid. You risk that you get into some really difficult situation of being able to enforce it. And the other thing I think you can say is don't be afraid of the big companies when you deal with them because the German legal system is allowing you to be really pretty much at par. So it's not so much like in the US where you have to be, where, where you have to spend enormous amounts to really run a lawsuit uh, successfully, if you have a powerful opponent, the German system is quite accessible for um, the normal people to get their rights. So you don't have to be worried that just because someone is financially stronger, more experienced, that you have no chance in winning against them in court. Yeah. yeah thank you, Volker. I think I think another big topic here is especially um, to, for, for foreigners who want to buy in Germany. That in general terms, we are do having a quite a safe investment place with a very strong legal side and Volker just mentioned this even with realistic funds to pay for a lawyer it's it's something where you are protected 
uh, especially once you own the property, the management and running costs compared to the purchase costs are very, very low. So um, this is a big advantage. I think we already touched the tax situation. We have touched the legal situation today quite a lot. Um, and um, important for, for, for anyone who has never purchased a property, most good estate agents and brokers, they will always have a letting and management department. They have uh, strong legal connections. They would refer you to an international law firm in Dubai because also the broker, they have a lot of responsibilities in Germany that they, they, they can be made liable. Please be sure anything you agree with the broker or with anyone that is not being notarized at the notary is not, basically doesn't exist anymore in property transactions. So everything has to, notarize, has to be notarized or has to be written down with your lawyer to be made sure. Um, there, there has been a question on commission for estate agents. Of course, this will change. So there is a change in law, uh, but only, on, uh, well, we are anticipating this law by end of the year. So the federal government has decided to regulate estate agent commissions. At the moment, every province, every city has different fees for estate agents. And a lot of our clients, of course, have asked us, um, and especially maybe have also asked uh, BPMK or other law firms, how does this work? So estate agents, you always can negotiate the commission with the estate agent, of course, at the moment and I think in the future as well. Um, there, for instance, in Berlin, the typical estate agent fee is 7.14%, um, only be paid by the buyer. And this is a historical situation since the early 60s, 70s, 80s, when the commission in Berlin has developed. Of course, the purchase price was much lower by then, but also the, um, the interest rate was much higher. So this is a different topic. Legally speaking, uh, please do ask your broker if you buy a property, if there's anything you need to know. If you want to sell a property, uh, it might be worth selling this year rather than next year because starting from January next year, you do have to pay the agent if he works for you and sells a property. For all those people out there, another question here is um, from a customer. He's considering to buy property in Germany and he doesn't want to use an estate agent. This, of course, is a very big market. Over 40% of all real estate transactions in Germany are being brokered not by agents, um, by private people. You also can buy directly from developers. But I highly recommend if you do so, and if you do not speak German, use a lawyer who makes sure that your um, transaction is legally safe. The agent's role, and this is the reason why you do pay a commission if you want to use them, are making sure that the commercial investment. So our role is not the legal, our role is the commercial aspects of any property transactions make sense for you. This is something you can uh, speak to your agent about and, uh, and you, in every different province of Germany. We have another two questions and I think we should then, um, because then we have the hour. Um, so um, uh, are the laws and property rights different in the, in the different German states when it comes to property ownership? For instance, buying in Brandenburg, Saxony, um, is different to Berlin, um, in, or is the land ownership different? Generally speaking, no. Yeah, the main law is the same, but there are for administrative laws, there are differences. Like for example, whether you can build something, how it's going to be built. These are all regional things. Um, whereas the the civil law, how you acquire real estate, how you purchase real estate, is um, something that is all the same over the, the whole country. You know, that's a federal law. Okay. I think the, the, the big difference, um, which is the next part of this question here from Edward, in, are the taxes. I think every province in Germany can raise different taxes, correct? Well, they can raise different taxes. On, well, they, they can only raise the taxes that they're allowed to. Yeah? So the general tax, tax right has the state. So the state could always come up with a new tax. Um, but the, the, the areas and the cities cannot, they just get basically the taxes that the state allows them to, to, to collect. And that is, um, the, um, that is the, uh, um, what I said before, the, the ground tax, yeah? the purchase tax, um, and then, which is not important for us so much, the commercial tax. Um, but the, the income tax, for example, is something that, is, that goes to the state, yeah? meaning the capital gains tax, so to say, because that's income tax and also the ongoing income. That's all on the state level. Um, I have a, the last question, I think, for today. Um, from a US citizen perspective, it appears to be very hard to buy in Germany. 
Are there custody solutions limiting the need to travel? Yeah, that's what I, what I tried to explain before. That is actually what we're working for. Now to make it comfortable for you to purchase, 95% of our clients do not come to Germany at all um, until they maybe want to see the apartment because they feel like they want to buy the interior of it or something. But legally, you don't have to come to Germany to, to make an investment here, um, to purchase and to become the full owner, no necessity. Necessity. So you don't need any tr trustees or something. You can just purchase the property without ever coming here. Um, and that's not really a problem. Great. Volker, thank you for, for this hour of your day. Okay. And um, for, do you have any other questions, Volker? No. If you have, I mean, I just wanted to propose again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me. Of course, I will not um, in... Uh, endlessly tell you tell you about German real estate, but you can be sure that before there's any kind of bill coming, I will let you know before we start the billable process. So thank you very much for having me. Yeah, um, thank you, it was very nice and um, looking forward to speaking to you again. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.